personally, of course, it was, it was an absolutely great feeling, particularly that my wife and I knew about it from watching television. You know, they, they, they usually call you half an hour before to, to give you the good news. But in, in our case, they thought if they would call, it would be, you know, media will know about it before they formally announce it. So it was not just an exhilarating experience. Just we're jumping out of joy at, you know, watching television. But on a more professional way, of course, the timing was absolutely perfect. You know, we were getting lots of, you know, criticism, uh, you know, on I was getting lots of, you know, uh, criticism by being outspoken, by being speaking out of the box, so to say. And I have been telling them then, I continue to tell them now, I have no box, you know. I have a job, I know that it can make the difference between war and peace, and I owe it to the people, I owe it to the silent majority in, uh, to, to speak up uh, on what I see is going wrong and how we, we can fix it. So. The Nobel Peace Prize, I think, was a shot in the arm. There's no question for us. It gave us additional visibility. It gave us uh, credibility. Uh, but it also gives us additional responsibility. Be, you know, that there's a lot of expectation that we, we can and we should perform to the best of our ability. I keep trying to lower this expectation by telling people we are just one player. You know, I, c you know, I can succeed if you help me. And that's why, you know, I'm now in everywhere when I go, I said civil society has a key role in, 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 in helping me, in helping my organization create a better security system. Because in the past, civil society has always focused on trade, on environment, but they, they thought that security is too sophisticated, that it should be left to government. That is bogus to me. I mean, this is, this is an issue has to do with our survival, you know, and Every one of us has a special responsibility to send a powerful message to the government that we need a better system so that we do not see millions of people dying every year in internal conflict or as a result of war. You know, in the last last decade, there are 11 million people who died in internal strifes. You know, uh, these to me are 11 million uh, lives too many, you know. In Iraq, you know, we had so far a hand, over 100,000 civilians who died, you know, innocent civilians who died, 100,000 people, too many, you know. And again, I, I say we still have 27,000 warheads. This is to me 27,000 warheads, too many. So uh, we, need, we need to think outside the box. People don't like that, you know, to be reminded of these realities, but these are realities. And and I, I, I have to, you know, I, I, I many times, you know, I ask myself, we must have a better way to resolve our differences, you know, through just killing each other. I grieve about every person who dies in, in war. You know, I grieve about the 2,200 American soldiers who lost their life. I grieve about the, you know, about this yeah, civ Iraqi civilian. I grieve about the 3 million some who died in the Congo War, I, I grieve about the 3,000, some who died in 9-11. These are all lives lost unnecessarily, and they they could have been still with us, and, and this is, it's a blot in our conscience, you know. Uh, we need to, you know, we need to understand that, you know, before deciding to go to war, you know, that we have exhausted every other possibility of reaching our differences through peaceful means, you know. Uh, Unfortunately, in the case of Iraq, you know, I, I believe we could have done that, you know, I at least, you know, through the inspection process, I was calling for, you know, a few months more to complete our work. We haven't seen indications of weapons of mass destruction. We haven't seen indication of nuclear weapons. I, I remember I asked at the Security Council for three more months to complete my work. And I remember exactly I said this is an investment in peace. Uh, unfortunately, it didn't work that way. There was faulty intelligence. Uh, there was, as you know, there was lots of other consideration probably, you know, that made uh, a decision to go to war, you know, uh, tempting uh, to get rid of Saddam Hussein. Saddam Hussein was a dictator, a ruthless dictator. There's no question about it. But I'm not sure that getting rid of every ruthless dictator around the world uh, justified that we kill civilians. So. Uh, there's lots of lessons I think we are learning from from Iraq that uh, 
one is we could we should not and could not jump the gun you know we have to rely on absolutely factual information we have to verify authenticate our information before we go uh, a second lesson that uh, and and, and, and until and, and le- as long as we have no imminent threat, no clear and present danger, we should continue to dialogue, uh, and 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 that we also need to understand where people are coming from. You know, when when we, we need to understand that a lot of these frustrations, a lot of these aggravations are are a feelings of a sense of humiliation. I think. I've come to realize that it's not really poverty that drives people bananas. You know, it's really a sense of injustice. You know, there's a lot of poor, poor people around the world. But when you repress the right of people to speak, when people feel that they are not being justly treated, uh, and you see a lot of that in the Middle East, you see a lot of that in the Muslim world. Uh, I think people are getting it both ways. They are getting it from their government when they feel that they're repressed by their government. They are not allowed to to have to, uh, the right to live in freedom and dignity. And they're getting it from the outside world when they feel that the outside world is not fairly treating them. Uh, they wake up in the morning, they see people dying in, uh, in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in the Palestinian territories. And the, the, sense, the sense of injustice, the sense of humiliation is very much there. I visit there, I, I see that emotional anger, you know, and, and that's if we want to start a, a system of security, we really need to address not the symptoms, you know, when we talk about terrorism, we cannot just say, let us use more force. I mean, force is not going to, 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 to end that phenomenon. We need to understand why these people are feeling the way they are feeling. This is a long-term process. This is sometimes goes beyond the term of any government. So government or uh, interest span is goes up to their next round of election. But, but these are, these are long-term, uh, processes that we need to endure, we need to go and understand the causes. Otherwise, it will be a flash fire, you know, somewhere, you know, it would be today's Iraq, tomorrow's Libya, to, you know, after tomorrow's Iran. But if we really want to, you know, avoid this temptation to develop uh, weapons of mass destruction, we need to provide security for people. And as I said, we need, we need to, to, the big boys to lead by example, you know, we, you know, any country who feel that they are threatened or if they feel that they would like, they are craving for power or, or influence, they would look at, uh, at the guys who are playing at the major league, you know, and the guys at the major league, you know, are saying, we would like to keep our nuclear weapons because our nuclear weapons are very important for their security. You cannot say that and ask everybody else to give up nuclear weapons or other weapons of mass destruction. I used once the metaphor that you cannot continue to to be a heavy smoker and dangle a cigarette from your mouth and tell everybody else, tell your kids not to smoke. Well, it doesn't work. Iran again is a very complicated issue. Iran is is really about security in the in the Middle East. Uh, uh, the nuclear issue is the tip of the iceberg in in Iran. Uh, we have it masks a lot of grievances from both sides it you know ranging from the hostage taking in 1979 to the overthrow of the nationally elected government in iran in the 50s the mossadegh government so there's a lot of grievances that span over five six decades and uh, the only way to resolve these issues of grievances insecurities it just for all the parties to sit and talk together i am delighted you know that now the U.S. have decided to to go and 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 talk to the Iranian directly, face to face, put all the issues on the table. We, that is the only way. I've been saying that for a couple of years. There is no there's no other solution. There's no military solution, and there is no solution that is enduring, uh, which is not a negotiated solution. Talking to each other does not mean weaknesses. Talking to each other does not does not mean that you uh, legitimize or delegitimize the a particular regime or you accept the record of human rights, none of that. Uh, talking to each other means that we have differences and we can only settle our differences through talking face to face, you know. And so I am hopeful. I hope that dialogue will will will, will flourish and uh, I will continue to do my very best to make sure that I continue in my little way to undergird that process and make sure that it comes to a fruitful fruition.
I don't believe in sanctions. I mean, you can you can go through escalation. You can go through using sanctions, uh, using pressure. Uh, it's a process when both parties will will hurt each other. It, we will go into a period of mutual hurting. Uh, sanction didn't work in the past. Will not work in the future. In fact, it it puts the hardliners in both in both camps in the driver's seat. You know, when you apply pressure. You know, it's hardliners who, who, who become popular. You know, uh, when you start dialogue, when you start exchange ideas, goods, uh, when people start to travel, when the Iranian people will continue to enjoy a new fleet of Boeing aircraft, when they start getting their new computer softwares, I think that's when you empower the silent majority in every country who are eager to have a decent life as part of the human community. My father was a lawyer. Uh, my mother was a homemaker. Uh, my father was uh, president of the Egyptian Bar Association. He was involved very much during the Nasser era, which was one of the most repressive era in e Egyptian history of fighting for democracy, fighting for human rights. Uh, and I think that to a lot of extent, you know, uh, shaped my view as to what I want to do in the future. I wanted to have a, a world when people are free to express their views, to have freedom of worship, to have freedom of want. And I saw poverty in Egypt when I grew up. And uh, to me, freedom in the larger sense, uh, be able to speak, to worship, free from want, from, from, free from fear, I think was, was a key as what I thought I would like to do when I grew up. I guess I thought law would give me the opportunity to work in the area when I had passion about, which is, as I said, try to be a social engineer, if you like, try to develop a society that is free, that is at peace with itself. And uh, I always want to be a lawyer. I, I, I'm not sure that I was influenced by my father. I think I was, I was just influenced by the environment under which I'm living. I was, I live in a, you know, an upper middle class community, so I didn't really personally had to suffer any of, at least, you know, uh, freedom from want or any of that stuff. But, but there was always fear around, you know, there was always fear around. And I, I saw that my father at one point was harassed just being able to, or being, trying to speak freely. And that, that really affected me deeply. And I, th I thought law is, is, is the best way for me to influence the shape of the future. And I wanted to be a lawyer in Egypt, as I mentioned. I wanted to practice there. I wanted to be directly involved in, in my society where I grew up. Uh, but things were just, were just too tough, you know, and I didn't see I could do much, you know, with, with socializing, you know, a, a policy of... Uh, socialism, which basically, again, uh, give very little for private practice for 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 a lawyer to be able, again, to uh, to work and express him express himself. And I thought, for a while, maybe diplomacy will give me the opportunity to go abroad, you know, to see an alternative lifestyle and see what I can learn. Eventually, I thought I should learn, you know, from through diplomacy, through living abroad, and then come back to Egypt and and be able to affect change. Unfortunately, it has been over 30 years when, I, when I'm going through the journey, but you never plan your life, Gil, the way you, want, you wanted. Uh, I know what I want to do, you know, and, and that's what I'm still doing, but uh, I'm doing it in different ways. And my focus when I left Egypt in the 60s was, you know, was Egypt-centered, you know. But then I went to New York, you know, I, and then I went to do my graduate work in New York, and, and there again, I recognized both through my academic studies, both my through my mentors in at university, both through living in this melting pot that uh, that the world is 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 just bigger than one country, and you are really better off if you if you have a global picture. If you want to achieve change, you shouldn't focus on one particular people, one particular country, one particular language, but but try to look at the global picture and 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 try to integrate uh, humanity. and And I think that. That's really now is my passion. And I think by doing this, I'm serving every single person in the world by trying to get all of us together. You know?
I found my niche there. You know, I find that I'm dealing with people from over 160, 70 nation at that time. I've been exposed to every culture, to every language, to every cuisine. And and I felt very much at home. I, I, I had a lot of fun, you know, and, and I realized how much we have in common, frankly. That's that was a key, how much we have in common, how much our values are shared values, how much we, you know, the, our differences are are really superficial at at, at at many levels, we talked about borders, nationality, ethnicity, but but you look at fundamentally our core values are absolutely shared. We have same hopes, same aspiration. Would like to get the best for our children. Would like to to live a good life. We, and that is that's really what I got from living in New York. That's where I got from working at the UN. That's where I I got through going to NYU Law School, and and again getting the intellectual discipline, how to channel this vision into a more effective way, you know. We had English at school. I mean, I think uh, through primary school, we studied English. And I think at grammar school, uh, we had uh, we had some French. I had for a couple of years a, a French nanny, you know, who, again, that was, I think, my father's long-term vision. He, he thought that languages are key you know, to development. And uh, so I grew up with three languages, if you like. And of course, they came, they came out handy in the future. You know, my, my children are even more fortunate. They have, they have four languages. My first mission, was, I was a young, you know, a young diplomat there. And uh, I was looking into the UN budget, the UN management. Uh, I was assigned also to look at the legal aspect of, you know, uh, working on, the treaty making, uh, I was also uh, looking into or give a glimpse into the effort to control nuclear weapons and other weapons of mass destruction. So it was a, it was a, it was a variety of experience. I was an apprentice at that time, you know, and uh, and that that is usually very, very helpful because you don't have the responsibility. You can just sit in the corner and look what other people are doing and learning, learning by watching, watching people uh, doing going around their job. But later on, of course, uh, then I progressed after New York. I went to to Egypt, and uh, you know, I work as a special assistant to the foreign minister who who picked me up after I uh, completed my doctorate in law. I should say, you know, at, during NYU, I think this was you know fantastic time of my my life. I had three years living at the Greenwich Village in New York, you know, exposed to the counterculture at that time, uh, seeing the different perspectives on life, seeing people rejecting the Vietnam War, supporting McGovern at that time. McGovern only got, you know, Massachusetts and, and I guess Greenwich Village, you know, but, but, but it showed, you know, how liberal, you know, environment I was living in. And uh, one of my mentors, Tom Frank, you know, who, you know, professor at law at NYU, I mean, he was really instrumental in making me understand, you know, that we need to, to look at the global picture and we always need to not take anything for granted, but go very much, you know, through a process of critical thinking before before we formulate our views. So he was he was, I think, instrumental in again shaping my views as how to pursue my my career in the future. Then I went then I went back. I, I mentioned you know, work with the foreign minister in 1974 in Egypt, and this was a crucial time. This was a time when, you know, after the 73 war between. Israel and Egypt, and uh, the effort to uh, to start a peace process. Uh, it was a fantastic for me as a young diplomat to sit in meeting with Henry Kissinger, going through his shuttle diplomacy, going to a meeting in the Oval Office with President Carter. I was all over the place, uh, seeing seeing people at a very high level of diplomacy. Again, watching carefully, seeing how people negotiate, how people interact, how people cut a deal, and. I would say these three, four years in working with, in, in as a special assistant, you know, as a confidant of the foreign minister uh, of Egypt, Mr. Fahmy at that time, was was crucial again in getting the practical experience how nations, people interact, and and you realize you realize at the end of the day, you know, how important the psychology, you know, of is, you know, it it is not as much about substance as much as about you know, how to, you know, to. To, to be able to uh, connect with people, how, how to be able to br bring your 
views across uh, how to you make to understand where people are coming from and at the end of the day how you uh, you cut a deal how you how you make a compromise i think this is the most important i think lesson you learn in life that you have to be ready to make a compromise you do not compromise your principles but uh, but but the, but you have to you have to be ready to compromise you have to understand that you cannot get your way 100% life is is too complicated you are not a, an island and you you work in a social setting and you need to to understand that you you work at always at the family level at the you know society level to to work out a compromise that is perceived to be fair not you don't get 100% what you want but at least you get the, the basic minimum you, you require i found a, a, a man of integrity absolutely you know people agreed disagreed on how effective he was as president but i think everybody uh, agree that he is the most effective post you know former president that uh, alive right now and I have a lot of respect and admiration for President Cantor. It was a delight when I got the Nobel Peace Prize to get a, a letter from him, and uh, this was to me meant a lot of a lot to me. The, getting that letter from a man who who is my idol in many ways. You know. He said, Ros "Rosalind and I, you know, are very delighted that you you got the Nobel Peace Prize, and you know, had a few words, nice words to say about my work, and uh, and as I said, this was this meant a lot to me." You know. Well, he's a model that he, he is always has the courage to express his views, his convictions. You know, he, he doesn't hesitate to, you know, to run against the current. You know, he, he has always has a moral certitude. He looks at the ethic and morality of his action. And that's that's key. You know, uh, you know, the, in whatever we do at at at, in life, you know, whether, as I said, privately or publicly, we need to have you know, a compass, you know, which is we need to be sure that what we do is is good for not only good for us, but but good for the people at large. And uh, and that that, you know, that's ethics, that's morality. I think we need to always to know that our work is not just g good for us in the in the in the short term, but it's it's morally correct, you know. And when I talk about morality, I don't talk about religion. I talk about, you know, morality in you know, a moral code, a moral value, which I think we all have, you know being honest, being fair, being correct, you know, and, and, and these are values I, I think we all share. You know. I think it's more modeling. I never I never bring my children and say, listen, this, these are the values you should you should uh, follow in life. I, I think it's a modeling by my wife and I. I mean, we I think we give them a good life. They show how we we go through life, you know, difficult time, hard time, good time. And uh, and I'm very happy that uh, and I think they are good kids. I mean, they are two kids. I mean, if I have hope, you know, I look at, at my children. My children grew up in six countries. They were born in Geneva. They went to grammar school in New York. They went to high school in Vienna. Uh, they went to college in, in London. They went to graduate schools in, in the US. And now they are working both in London. So uh, for them, you know, they are absolutely uh, colorblind. They are absolutely religious blind. They are absolutely ethnic blind i mean for them my home is the world for him for them they every every human being is just one member of that large human family we have so if we have more of these kids if, if we have more of my children i think i think will in my view we will not have war we'll not continue to kill each other like we we did in in the stone age but but the key is get as many people exposed the, the key is get many people to travel and and this achievement summit here is 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 exactly what we need that in a hundred million million times you know get everybody to see the rest of the world to interact with the other people and then you realize how much the stereotyping the us versus them will evaporate you know i was the other day saying that my wife and i having spent over 30 35 years you know in different countries we fit more or less everywhere we do not fit 100% anywhere, but we fit ev more or less everywhere in the world. So we feel comfortable wherever we are, and oh, which is a great feeling, you know, which is an absolutely great feeling. I worked for, for, with the foreign ministry for a while until 1980. I thought at that time, again, 
with my view that I need to 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 look at the global picture. I need to work with the international community at large. I felt working with the foreign se- service is too restricting for me, and uh, I was grabbed the opportunity when I was offered a, a job with the United Nations in in 1980, and that's how I started working with international institution. I worked with the UN Institute for Training and Research for a number of years where again I was in charge of international law teaching teaching international law at uh, at NYU at that time and then I moved to the IAEA the International Atomic Energy Agency in 1984 and this was a long journey of 21 years now when I started you know as the agency rep in New York then a legal advisor to the agency in Vienna then assistant director general and since 19 97, uh, I have been elected a director general, and it hasn't been a quiet time since. As you know, we got into Iraq, we got into North Korea, we get into Iran, and and I have come to realize that a lot of our work could make the difference between war, between war and peace. And uh, it's it's work that, uh, in a way, uh, is my passion because in a way I I know we can through not only through our work but through my work and other people who are doing similar work, create a safe and more humane world, or we can usher the beginning of our destruction. So it's, uh, it's some people call it God's work. I, 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 don't, I don't call it that way. I, I call it uh, a work that uh, I cannot see uh, that, it, uh, that I, would stop, I would stop doing as long as I'm able to do it. First of all, you, you, you learn to manage stress. You, you, you learn to live with stress. I mean, stress is there all the time. There's no question about it. It's, it's in the morning, it's at night, it's at three in the morning, but you need, to ha- you need to learn how to manage stress. Sometimes it's more difficult than other, but you try to distract yourself. I mean, I, I, whenever I have the chance, you know, I, I like to go and have a round of golf. I'd like to, you know, I have a passion for modern art. I have a passion for antique carpets. Uh, classical music, you know, uh, to me these are distractions, you know. And sometimes uh, my wife, she she think I'm I'm obsessed with these little things. But uh, she, I tell her, you know, it is my way of distracting myself from just constantly uh, continuing about my my work. But the stress is there. But sometimes, as I sometimes you just the euphoria also you get from a sense of achievement. Uh, in many ways, compensate all the stress you had in for a year or two. You know, as I said, when you see I've done something which has a positive impact on humanity, it just recently I, you know, I was in Ghana, you know, and I saw that we provided a radiotherapy machine, you know, to treat uh, people with cancer in Ghana. Uh, it was the only radiotherapy machine in Ghana, and uh, people from four different neighboring countries came to be treated. Uh, with this machine you have no idea how the sense of achievement how you know here is something well not earth shattering but here's something at least where my organization and i could could make a difference in 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 me helping people to survive There's a lot people forget because forget that the positive aspect of nuclear because what they see in in, in the media all the time is that is the negative aspect of nuclear is is the agency role as a watchdog as as at is as it is called but they forget that we still get 16 percent of the world electricity from nuclear energy uh, they forget that we need nuclear energy at least for the next 50 years because uh, we only have nuclear energy and fossil fuel gas and and coal and gas and coal has their own problem uh, climate change and you know uh, uh, you know, and and nuclear, of course, has the risk of a, as a severe accident. Uh, so, but we need both. We need to have a ways of cost and benefit. We need to understand that the benefit outweigh the cost. I always give the example of flying. You know, when we fly, we take risk. But but if we don't fly and we go walking, you know, you make the choice. You know, either you go to New York for in in one week. Uh, tr- you know. Uh, driving and even there you take some risk or you fly in in five hours so same same with energy there is no there is no source of energy that does not have some risk and 
what we try to do with nuclear you know, is maximize the benefit and minimize the risk. Uh, then, of course, there are those all other applications of, of nuclear. Uh, in the, in the me medical field, for example, diagnosis and treatment of cancer, diagnosis of heart diseases, I mean, through radioisotopes, is, is I think every one of us would know a person who have, who have been diagnosed with cancer or have been treated through radiotherapy. Or, or through nuclear medicine, for example. That's that's an area where we I would like to see maximizing, you know, it around the globe. But unfortunately, we don't have enough resources to do more. But this is an area when I'd like to see the agency doing more in the area of water resources. Water is becoming so scarce, and we do again use radioisotope techniques to manage uh, to help countries manage groundwater sustainably. Uh, in the area of agriculture, lots of lots of New varieties of of crops are are being developed through mutation. You know, it's not genetically engineering, but through natural mutation. So, in the area of agriculture, health, water, industry, that of course electricity generation, uh, nuclear still has a very important role to play. I give you I give you one example. When I went to Nigeria uh, recently, <laughs> now, and I compare that with the U.S. In the U.S., you know, you have uh, 16,000, every American have 16,000 kilowatt hours of electricity per year. Uh, that is enough, obviously, you know, to uh, empower your, uh, 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 your refrigerators, your air conditioning, your iPods, everything you need, you know. In, in Nigeria, they have 70 kilowatt hour per year, you know. That is translate into eight watt light bulb that's not even enough to power your personal computer. You know, without energy, there is no development. Without development, there is a sense of despair, and without this, with with a sense of despair, there is extremism. We need to understand always, you know, the link between development and security. And I think that's something we President Clinton was talking about yesterday, and that's something I very strongly believe in. And people need to understand, you know. We cannot just erect borders. We cannot erect walls between the north and the south, between the rich and the poor. We need to make sure that we have an equitable world when every human being has the right to live a decent life, the life, the right to live a life free from fear, the life to be able to send his kids to, to have education, the life to have a so social security in their old age. If you do that, I think the, the insecurities we feel, the extremism that we are seeing will drop absolutely dramatically. Unfortunately, it hasn't worked quite out that way until now, because at that time, everybody was euphoric, you know, that we will have a new world order, you know, a world order that does not rely on nuclear weapons, nuclear deterrence. Unfortunately, it didn't work that way. Uh, we still have thousands of warheads in existence. We still have more than 20, 30 countries relying on nuclear deterrence for the, on their survival. It's always baffling to me. I mean, we, you know, we seem to, as we mentioned, to appreciate each other's culture. You know, you would like to go and have an Ethiopian meal at uh, Adams Morgan. You know, uh, you would like to go and, you know, have a Ashtanga yoga, you know. Uh, but when it comes, when it comes to resolving our our differences, it's really the Stone Age. It's, it's who has the biggest club. And we need to move away from that. We just need to understand that any system of security is, has to be based on sh human solidarity. It should be people-centered, and it should be based on, on a world that is interdependent, integrated, that where everybody understands that, you know, Security is not is not just based on border or language. Security is based on providing every single member of this one human family the right to to live in in peace and dignity. I think if we do that, you will see that we will not talk about war, but we'll be talking about art, about culture, about education, about health. Uh, lots of work we still need to do, and uh, we need to start. As I said, we need to start with development work, but we also need to start with the Weapon states, the U.S., the Russia, uh, leading by example. Uh, they haven't been leading by example. Uh, they have been continuing to send the message that we 
we would like to keep our nuclear weapons. We'd like to continue to rely on our nuclear weapons. We'd we'll like to modernize our nuclear arsenal. These are statements completely contrary to their commitment in 1970 to move toward nuclear disarmament. The whole non-proliferation regime was based on a commitment by those who do not have nuclear weapons, not to have them, but also equally a commitment by the five nuclear weapon states to move toward nuclear disarmament. And 30 years after the non-proliferation treaty, we're still far away from that goal. I talked about psychology in negotiation. I told about it. Lots of our differences is really not about substance, but, but it's about the way we were brought up in kindergarten, I think. I don't want to I don't want to share my toy, you know. I, I, I would like to have the whole pie for myself, you know. It's the art of sharing, it's the art of understanding that we need to share, we need to have a, a fair system of distribution that lies at the heart of our security or insecurity right now. My my response that instead of just saying this is the only effective deterrent, you should try to work an alternative deterrent. I mean, we are the one who created that nuclear deterrent, but to, we, we, we owe it to humanity to, to work on alternative deterrent. You know, uh, we cannot continue, you know, there's lots of ways that one can think of, you know, uh, that to have a world that does not rely on nuclear, nuclear weapons. Of course, as I said, an important part is this interdependence, is this integration that which would make it too costly, you know, to, to resort to war. If I look at the European Union right now, it's absurd to think that any of member of the European Union will go to war, you know, over, you know, over their differences. They would continue to play dirty tricks against each other. They will <clears throat> continue probably to cheat each other here and there, but I don't think they will ever think of using force. And can we expand that European model of 25 countries to be a global model? So it is not, <clears throat> it is not unthinkable. It's just a question of getting people and countries to integrate, getting people and, and countries to understand that what they have in common is much more than what separates them. And then the whole idea of borders, uh, you know, resources, nationalities, language will disappear. And we will have to find a better way to resolve our differences peacefully. It is not an easy thing, but, uh, but if we really believe that, you know, we have, we have reaching a fork on the road right now. Either, you know, because technology is out of the tube, you know, in, in everywhere, you know, chemical weapon, biological weapon, nuclear weapon. Either we're going to, to see President Kennedy's prediction in the 60s that we'll have 20, 30 countries with nuclear weapons, which to me is the beginning of the end for civilization, because the possibility of uh, having a nuclear holocaust through miscalculation, through, uh, through unintentional error, uh, is, is there, or, or we are going to say, well, we, we have to get rid of these nuclear weapons. We have to, we cannot continue to live under this Democles sword of, of a world that could be, uh, destroy itself in, in a matter of an hour. I mean, right now we still have the, the, uh, missile, the US missiles, the Russian missile at, you know, targeted at each other when the president of, of, of either country, you know, has half an hour, you know, to to react in case of a, a report of a, of a nuclear attack. You know, I I was talking to Sam Nunn. I was talking to Bill Perry last week, and uh, it just you know unfathom unfastenable for them, you know, and for me, that 15 years after the Cold War, Cold War we still live under this uh, hair trigger alert. Uh, uh, between between the Soviet between Russia and the U.S. So, lots of work can can be done, and we but we need to take a cold-headed approach, and we have to understand that business as usual is not the way. You know, we need to absolutely look for a new framework for security. Uh, is not based on more armament, but is based on integration of humanity, reducing the inequalities, and trying to build institutions that help us to find peaceful solution to our differences. I have very much a concept an American dream. Uh, American dream meaning to be free, uh, to be able to achieve what you want to do, uh, to have the environment within which you can excel. Uh, I have always been an 
admirer of the American dream. Uh, we grew up, you know, admiring the the, the freedom you have in in, in the U.S., the, the the equality, the egalitarian system you have in the U.S. And I hope, you know, with uh, you know, with all the restrictions that we have seen after 9/11 that we will someday go back where the U.S. American dream will be the way I saw it when I was growing up here in the 60s. I, it's a model, you know, has to, you know, might not be replicated 100% everywhere else, but the basic element of the American dream is the future for humanity.